say that some of you are going to wish you hadn't come to church. Let that sink in a little bit. Amen? Because most of us would rather be uninformed too often. But uh, today I just want to give you some information I think that's really going to help you because I really believe in the day and the age, the culture that we live in that most people are completely misunderstanding about this one particular topic. Because the Bible has a lot of wine in it, doesn't it? Jesus turning water into wine and all those things, and there's just a lot of wine in the Bible. So I want to approach this three different ways. One, as an apologist, to kind of give you an idea of where we are. That doesn't mean apologize. It talks about the biblical approach to living our life and why we believe that's true. The second reason, uh, I want to give you a theological perspective as well as a historical perspective. But more than that, I want to give you a pastor's heart about this message. So you may be one of the 75% of Americans who... Who drink? You may have an occasional drink. It may be once a day. It may be all day long. I don't know. It may be occasionally with a meal. It might be on vacation. I, I don't know. But I do know that 75% of Americans drink. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's part of their lifestyle. We also know there's a multiple millions upon millions of people who have problems with alcohol and alcoholics, problem drinkers, all the different titles. But pretty much all stand for this, the same thing. There's an addiction to alcohol. Uh, uh, so as I enter in this, you know, I, I want to deal with it from a church perspective, from a believer's perspective, and what does the Bible say? And because that's really what, all that matters in our life, isn't it? All right, what, what does the Bible say? What does the Word of God teach? What's expedient, what's not expedient? What, what's righteous and what's unrighteous? So this is an opportunity to, to examine the Word and research the truth. And I come to this because probably in the last few months I've had more people ask me about this particular topic than about anything else that they've talked to me about. In fact, I, I shared some of this with a, uh, one of the members over at Magnolia campus about eight weeks ago, kind of pulled me to the side and we went over some of this and what I felt like the Word of God pretty much clear, clearly says and uh, didn't leave it at personal opinion. Here's just what the Bible says. And you have to establish your opinion after that. And today she was giving a glorious testimony. She says, you know, I, I, says, I, I, I was that social drinker in the church. You know, I have lots of friends. We do this. And I'd be at a party or an event or in a picnic or something. You know, I'd, I, I'd be that person. She said, but I want you to know, she said, this is, that was the most liberating thing you shared with me in those few minutes in my life. Uh, one, to realize I don't have to. Two, is to realize that I have a testimony. And so we dealt with those things. It was just a great, great report that came from that. And a lot of people feel in the culture that we live in because we are so inundated with the, the, the mindset that we ought to be drinking if we don't have a glass of wine, if we don't drink a beer, if we don't have a margarita, or we don't sip a pina colada, and something's really got to be wrong with us. I mean, that's pretty much the way it is. Then the you, you know, first thing they ask you when you sit down at the table is, would you like a drink? You know, you want to. Of course, that's all about making money. They make a lot more money off the booze than they do the soda water. But you know, can can I bring you a drink? You know, and I always use that as an opportunity to tell people, you know, hey, I, I grew up and. Uh, Got away from that and found out there's a better way of living my life. I drink from a different cup now. So it is an opportunity, but I think, you know, I, I know all the arguments for drinking. I've been doing this 40 years, okay? So I know all that people use, and, but I'd say I, want to, I, I want to approach this under two things. One is a concept of grace. I want you to understand the grace of God, but also I want you to understand that as a pastor, I've seen the destruction that, that alcohol has in so many people's life and the destructive nature of alcohol and how it ruins and tears and destroys in so many hearts and lives. So I think a lot of it is just a lack of information. I mean, the church really doesn't know what the Bible says, but that's pretty much true about a lot of stuff, isn't it? The church doesn't always know what the Bible says because a lot of preachers aren't really preaching the Bible, you know? They'll preach parts of the Bible that appeal to people, but you know, you're not going to hear this in the secret sensitive churches this morning on the word and the wine. I mean, that's just not going to be a message that's going to be preached in, in, in some of those situations because uh, somebody is afraid of offending somebody. But I want you to know if you're offended today, that's not the reason I'm preaching this message. Not about offending you, you know. And you may walk out of this service and say, well, I just, don't, I, just, you know, I just have a completely different opinion about that. I ain't never going back there. Hey, don't go by that either. You're more than welcome to come back. Hey, my wife never agrees with me on half the stuff. She's here every Sunday. <laughs> so it's possible to disagree with me, all right? And we can have fellowship. The idea is there's truth here that I want to share with you this morning, and I want to look at several things. One, just the, the call of grace and the, and the, and, and the 
the, the higher life God's called us to live. But I also want to talk to you about the historical use of wine because there's so many people say, well, it's in the Bible and they don't have any comprehension of what they're talking about. They've never taken time to really look at it. When you look in the Bible, even if you go to your concordance, you look in some Hebrew dictionary, Greek dictionary, there's about 11 different words or more in the Bible that talk about wine or strong drink. So it's easy to, you know, to, to get confused. We, we know that the scripture doesn't always con, con, condemn drunken. I mean, always does condemn drunkenness no matter what. If you call yourself whatever mild drinker, light drinker, certainly the Bible always condemns getting drunk. I mean, we even have public laws against public intoxication. So we ought to all be on the same page as on that. All right. You shouldn't get drunk. <laughs> Took you all, didn't it? We shouldn't get drunk. Okay. Let's have a hearty. Amen. I shouldn't get drunk. If I get drunk, I'm, I'm definitely out of the bounds of, 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 of grace in my life. I'm, I'm moving into an area of, of, of just being an idiot, according to what the scripture has to say. And we'll look at that. But the scripture, you know, does, it's a lot of, in the Bible, you got Noah, who after the flood, you know, got drunk and was naked in the room. And the sons came in and the things that came out of that deal. And then you look at Lot's daughters who, who got Lot drunk after Sodom and Gomorrah's deal and committed incest with him. And then you know, one of the great drunk stories of all is in Belshazzar, you know, and, and when he has that great feast and he's drinking the wine, everybody's getting stoned out of their mind, drunk out of their minds, and they're drinking from the holy vessels. And the finger of God wrote against the wall and it was a pronouncement of judgment. So there's a lot of condemnation of drunkenness in the scriptures. You don't have to go very far to come up with the fact, as a believer, you shouldn't get drunk. Let's say it together. I shouldn't get drunk. So we got that part settled. But then there's other things when you see in the Bible, there seems to be contradictions where you see that it, the Bible almost condones or does condone the drinking of, of wine. There's drink offerings of wine that accompany some of the sacrifices of the Old Testament. There's a few places where, where the, the scriptures tell them to, to take a drink. Uh, some people that should drink, give strong drink to him that's dying. So anybody perishing in this moment? Yeah, I know some of you say, well, I'm always dying, you know, so no. To give, give strong drink. Even Paul told Timothy, you know, don't drink water alone, not exclusively. Drink some, drink a little wine, catch that, a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments, all right? So it was used as medicinal, for medicinal purposes here. But uh, obviously the water was a problem. We'll talk about that in a moment. And the wine being added, we'll see, was supposed to be as a remedy for some, what was happening in his life. But let's look at some of these words just from a theological viewpoint real quick. And I guess the question I would ask this today as we look at these different words from the Bible that talk about wine, kind of keeping the, the context or the question in your mind that would say something like, uh, is, is, is what we're talking about in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament the same wine and, the, and strong drink that we have today, or is it two different things? Is, is the Bible wine the same as cultural wine up in, in the Western Hemisphere today? And we'll see some things. So one of the, the Hebrew words that's used in the Old Testament for a, one of the kind of wines is the word shakar in the Hebrew, and it's usually translated as strong drink. You'll see tr where it talks about wine or strong drink. This is the one that's most used is, is strong drink because of the, the alcoholic content. And then there's another word in Proverbs 20 that you, where it uses this as a strong drink. It says, wine's a mocker, strong drink. Strong drink is a brawler or is raging. If you're deceived by it, you're not wise. King James says, if you're deceived by it, you're a fool. So, so that, that's one of the words in the scripture. There's another word, it's, it's this word glucose. And we get our word glucose, the English word come from this. It was a new wine, very sweet, uh, especially, and it corresponds with the, with the Hebrew word tarosh. And it's referenced in Proverbs 3.10, where it says there, so your barns will be filled with plenty, your vats will overflow with new wine. Hosea 9 says the threshing floor and the wine press will not feed them and the new wine will, will fail them. And this particular wine was usually, and it, it, it was very sweet and it was usually mixed with water in the drinking process of it. But most of the wine, when you see the wine, Jesus turning the water into wine, you see most of the references in the Old Testament, New Testament, it was, it was a different kind than what we're talking about with this glucose and this strong drink. The Greek word for it was oinos, all right? And the, new, and the Hebrew word was ayin. And uh, it, was, it was unique in the way that, it, that the grapes were processed and the way it was dealt with. Uh, yayin has a, has a root meaning of literally just to bubble up, but not due to the, to the process or be un, going under fermentation, but the way it was reduced down to become a thick paste. And it, this was a common practice of, of the culture and of the time. 
where these, that the, uh, the, 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 the grapes and the juice would be boiled down, first of all, to kill the bacteria. If you've ever made preserves or jams or something like that, where there's this boiling process where things just boil down, it becomes really, really thick, and it becomes a concentrate. Now, that was, that was main reason was to kill all the bacteria, like as it is with preserves and jams and jellies, to, to kill the bacteria that be present in the fruit. It also required less storage space. So when, when it come time, if you had a large vineyard, you know, and as it was used, it'd be taken out of storage, and the paste would be added to the water, and it'd be remixed. Now, they would, at times, take and remix that paste, and then it would go through a ferment. They'd let it spoil, so it's become, and to have an alcoholic content. But it had a much lower alcohol content than what you would get if you went down to the store at H-E-B or wherever and bought a bottle of wine, all right? Uh, the practice of boiling the grapes juiced down to this pasty syrup was common practice. And this is not something you, this is not, I didn't get this information from the Bible. You get it from the library. You get this from any reference book and any historical culture book. This process still exists in a lot of Arab countries in Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and these places. If you study history about this particular process, there's a lot of people, you may even know names like Aristotle and Homer and Pliny and some of these other writers from the ancient times who talked about these. Aristotle described it, the wine as is, is, is being so thick that it had to be scraped from the skins it was stored in and the scrapings needed to be diluted with water in order to even make a drink. Horace wrote 35 BC that this process, at this point, it was prior to fermentation, these were, and it was a non-intoxicating wine. And even if it did process, you'd have to drink a lot of it, even if it went through a fermentation process to get drunk. Pliny, who was a Roman author, uh, a naturalist, a natural philosopher. He wrote about it and he said, uh, he was a naval commander in the early Roman Empire. He, he referred to this wine as a non-intoxicating wine as well. And then Homer, you're familiar, read the Odyssey and these other things. He tells Ulysses, Homer does, in, in the ninth book of Odyssey, uh, that he's put in his boat a goat skin filled with sweet black wine that was, has been already diluted for him for a 20 to one consumption. In other words, they take one part of this thick paste and add 20 parts water. Now, a lot of Christians mistakenly assume because they won't take time to really research and see what the Bible has to say and see what's really being talked about here. They assume that the New Testament, when it says wine, is the same kind of wine that you would go get off a shelf in a liquor store or at a restaurant or being served at the, at, at, at the local cafe somewhere. But they're not the same. In fact, what we would have today in a bottle of wine or in booze of any kind with, the, with a high alcohol content would not be called wine in those days. It would be referred to as strong drink because of the high alcohol content. It was a very clear delineation between those things. In fact, most of the known world didn't discover distillation until about 1500 AD. There were a few like the Egyptians who had that process, but you know, most people who drink today are completely foreign to anything I'm telling you right now about what wine was in the day of Jesus and the early days of, our, uh, uh, of civilization. And they try to compare wine that you buy at the store, what they would have a glass of at dinner with. They try to compare that to what was being drunk in the times of Jesus. And you just can't compare those things. All right. So, well, I don't believe you, Pastor. Well, just go to the library this afternoon, all right, and, and read for yourself. It's pretty clear. This is not hidden mysteries, his, hidden mysteries from our culture. Right? It's pretty clear and plain to read. In fact, if you think that what you're drinking from that bottle is the same as what they, well, you can't compare them. It's like comparing carrying the donkey that Jesus rode into Jerusalem with, you know, your SUV out in the parking lot. <laughs> There's two different things, all right? You can't compare them. They're both transportation, but they're not the same. In fact, today's wine mostly falls under the definition of strong drink, and the Bible has a lot to say about strong drink. But wine drinking in the ancient world, at least if you look in Jewish sources in the Bible, uh, you, can, you can see that... Uh, uh, in the sources I was looking at, as well as in the scripture, as well as in history, you'll find out several things about this paste and how it was used. All right. In Homer's day, it was 20 parts added to one part wine of water. Pliny, this Roman author I talked about, he referred to wine as eight parts water and one part wine. That's in the book of natural history. According to Aristophanes, it was stronger. He said you should mix it uh, three parts water and two parts wine. And other classical Greek writers wrote of it. There was a guy named Ionis, and he, he said it should be three parts water, one part wine. 
Hesiod said it was three to one water to wine. Alexis said four to one. Diocles and Anseron, they said two to one and others said three to one. But the average for all these mixtures in culture of taking wine and drinking wine was always this one part wine to three or four parts water. All right. Now, again, we make a distinction here what the Bible talks about wine and strong drink, because the Bible does make that distinction that there is a difference between wine and strong drink. And several scriptures in Proverbs and the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, talk about the difference. In Deuteronomy, it says this, you have not eaten bread, nor have you drunk wine or strong drink in order that you might know that I am the Lord your God. In Judges, he says this in chapter 13, now therefore be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor to eat any unclean thing. The Lord was giving them preparation for something. According to the Talmud, the Passover wine that would be used, you know, in the time of Christ, according to the Talmud, that the pass, for the Passover meal, the wine was three parts water and one part wine. Now, Jesus did turn the water into wine, but you have to realize that it was probably I can guarantee it wasn't the wine like we're getting here from the liquor store today, all right, or from your favorite wine vendor. It just wasn't the same. Jesus probably provided 65 to 70 gallons of wine at that wedding, according to the containers that are listed there and what size those containers were. I don't think Jesus is getting everybody trunked up and trunk at the wedding. It just wasn't in his holy nature. When he is the living premise of all that the word of God is, do you think Jesus, let me put it this way, do you think Jesus drank wine? Well, I think he drank this kind of wine, it's obvious. Did Jesus get drunk? Well, the Pharisees accused him of that. There's a passage in the New Testament, it's in Mark, I believe also in John, when it says Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees, and he said, well, you said that John, you know, had, John the Baptist had a demon, and the Son of Man is, 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 is eating and drinking with drunkards and, 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 and the unrighteous. Now, what they were doing, Jesus said, you're accusing me. Well, they accused John the Baptist of having a demon. Did he have a demon? No. Did Jesus get drunk? No. Did Jesus drink wine? The wine of the day. But did Jesus get in touch? You say, how do you know Jesus didn't get drunk? How do you know? I saw on the internet, Jesus got drunk. <laughs> because if you read the Levitical law, there were strong strong commands to priests and to the high priest that they could not drink strong drink. Now to get drunk, you had to drink the strong drink. Jesus was the absolute fulfillment of the law. He would not break the law. In, did Jesus break the law in any area? No. He was an absolute fulfillment of all that the law was genuinely representing. And he was righteous. And if anyone was ever, you know, righteous, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want to use the excuse that Jesus drank wine, then I, I, I'll go with that. Then you need to drink the wine that Jesus drank. And then you also need to be like Jesus because he was always fasting, always praying. He was the living epitome of all that ever came out of his mouth was the word of God. Let's fall into that camp. I'm all for it. Amen. <laughs> I'm all for that. But again, what we're talking about today, are, it's, it's, a, it's a completely different animal. It's just not the same things. In ancient times, many times, the beverages, even the water in most of those cities, we've talked about this in different Bible studies, the water in those cities had to be purified in different ways. It could be boiled, which, you know, that was tedious to take water in, boil it, change it, change it, boil it, costly process. Or you could filter it, which was not a safe method because they don't have the kind of technology for filtering that we had today. So most of the time, what people did to purify the water is they, they'd use that 20 to one mixture of putting some wine into the water that would have some alcohol content at just enough, probably about 3.2% alcohol would at, at its best. If he mixed it one to four, it'd be 3.2. 3.2, if I put 3.2 in something today, I don't have to register it as an alcoholic beverage because it's so low. I think you have to have 3.6. Uh, and it, with the FDA to, to register as an alcoholic beverage. So it is so low, the only, ability it has there is just basically to, to cleanse and to kill the bacteria that's within the drink. One writer in the Christianity Today, which is not my favorite magazine, but he put it this way. He said, the ancient Greeks kept their unboiled, undiluted wine in large jugs if it hadn't been boiled down. And those were called amphorae. Before drinking, they'd pour it into smaller vessels called craters. And then they would do it water as much as 20 to one. Unmixed wine, even among the pagans, was considered to be irresponsible. It's clear that the oinos of scripture is not the wine of today. It's, it, again, this doesn't take a genius to look this up and see it. 
it surely indicates, you know, that, that what we're having with a bottle of wine today, which is anywhere from 6 to 11% alcohol, is not anywhere near to what they were drinking in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess what I really want to say today, if, you, if you're willing to take those facts and look at them clearly to see what it was and what we call today wine, what we look at today wine, I think it should create some kind of thought process in your life to, to say, hey, you know, is wine really the best choice? Is today's wine really the best choice for my, my life? And by the way, m some folks don't know it's not really necessary to drink alcohol. <laughs> it's not. Oh, Brother Joe, if I don't drink, I have a lot of friends and I'm in a place of influence. And if I don't drink, you know, well, they'll be offended, you know, so I don't want to offend anybody. Listen, you're not going to embarrass a friend, a relative, acquaintance or a foreign neighbor if you respectfully decline an offer to drink. All right. Uh, out of honest conviction, instead of some self-righteous judgmental motivation, well, I don't drink, not that attitude. But that's, you know, that's, I, I just don't drink anymore. You know, I, I've given that up. Just consider this for a moment. Before you decide to say, hey, I'm really going to embrace where, I, where, where my, my, my mindset has always been, this little drink here is not going to hurt me, and everybody's doing it, and I'm under grace, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But if that's what I'm going to do, consider something, just for a moment, of just how dangerous, if we'll just take the blinders off for a moment, just how dangerous alcohol really is, and how much damage it's done in our nation, how much damage it's done to homes, how many people have been hurt by it, 50% of the fatal car accidents in this nation, over 50% of them were caused by, as a result of, of people getting drunk, having too much drink and losing control. 64% of the murders in this country are associated with alcohol. They say that one out of every 10 social drinkers becomes an alcoholic or problem drinker. One out of 10. An alcoholic. Now there's another term which is doesn't quite, you're not quite an alcoholic, you're just a problem drinker. They say that 30% of the people who drink, 33 to that one third of those people who drink are problem drinkers and become problem drinkers. So one out of every three people who drink basically are going to have a problem with it down the road. 500,000, uh, well, the alcohol is the number two killer among uh, heart, behind heart disease and even more cancer. 500,000 Americans die each year from alcoholism. Fetal alcohol syndrome is the third great the third greatest cause of birth defects. It's the highest cause of birth defects in some areas. But we just don't look at how, how volatile this issue really is and how bad alcohol really is. When you take a drink of alcohol, it immediately begins to be absorbed through the, th th into the blood. I mean, before it even gets to the stomach, it's going into the blood vessels, it's going into the, it's going into the brain. And it, you probably heard, even as a junior high person in, in health class, that if you drink, every drink you take, every drop you drink, it immediately begins to destroy the, the cells of your brain. Now, that's partly my excuse. You know, I drank a long time before I got saved. And I drank a lot before I got saved. And I'm praying daily God restores those things. But I'd be really smart if I hadn't drunk so much. And so would you, amen? But, you know, we look at these problems and, you know, it's since, since there's wine and places it talks about drinking wine and Bible talks about not moderation in all things, you know, and it's not so much this specific forbidden thing about wine in scripture. It is about strong drink, by the way. But most people won't associate what they're drinking with strong drink. Most people just kind of look at it and say, well, this, this really falls into the realm of choice. It's, it's a decision that, that I, 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 need to, I, I can make because, you know, we're all under grace and we're not under the law. You know, the apostles said in 1 Corinthians, he says, you know, all things are lawful for me, but not everything's expedient. All things, all things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. You know, I'm under grace, yes. There's nothing can take my salvation away. I'm saved all the way that I stand before Jesus one day. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to do all things. It doesn't mean I'm going to go commit those particular things, especially when the Bible, I'm a Christian, I take serious the words that are on those pages and the Bible says, hey, you can do that, but you're foolish if you do it. You'll wreck your life if you do it. This is where it's going to lead you if you do it. I mean, you used to read a little bit of Proverbs and you see this. There's, there, 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 there's an understanding we have to come to that if you really are a believer, you, you're called to a higher standard. All right, and a lot of people don't understand this. I'm a Christian, 
It's not my job as your pastor to say, don't drink, don't drink, don't drink. It's my job as a believer and as a pastor to say to you, hey, there's a better way. We need, we're called to a higher standard. There's a higher way of living your life. There's a better way of living your life. And there's a freer way of living your life that won't ruin your life and won't damage your life and won't damage your family. This is a better way of living. Even in the Old Testament, there's going to be this little Old Testament consideration right quick. If you were called as a child of God and called to serve God, which in the New Testament we all are, right? We're, we are what? We're kings, right? And we're priests, right? We're children of God. So God's called us as new creations to be the living light of this world or in the salt of the earth. So we've been called to live a different kind of life than the rest of the world lives. All right. And even in the Old Testament, you see this, this example given to us, it, it, the more responsibility that God placed upon you in scriptures, then the more accountability you had to the Lord God himself. In Leviticus, here's an illustration for it. The ordinary person was able to give a, in sacrifice time to bring a female goat or even a lamb as a sin offering. If you didn't have that, then you could bring two pigeons or two doves. But if you were real poor, the very poor were, were allowed to bring a grain offering to the Lord. That would work. But that's just the everybody else. What about those who've been called? What about the king? What about the rulers? What about the priest? Well, the ruler could not give pigeons. He had to give a male goat, all right? He couldn't give that lesser offering. The high priest, he had to offer a bull, all right? He, he, it couldn't be satisfied with just offering something small. And the, the priest, not the high priest, but the priests themselves, they were not to drink, drink anything that was strong drink. In fact, Leviticus 10 puts it this way, do, talking to the priest which we are priests unto the Lord. Do not drink wine and strong drink, neither are you nor your sons are your sons with you. It's a pretty clear word. Now, I think that's the word that Jesus lived by. All right? Don't do that. Remember, again, strong drink in, re in, refer in references to the, the idea of most of the alcohol that's being purchased today. Now, in Proverbs, it says this. Verse 31, 4, 5. He's talking about the kings. It is not for kings, Olamul. It is not for kings to drink wine, that's yayin, or for rulers to drink shakar, strong drink, lest they drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. In other words, you drink that stuff, it's going to go to your brain, you're going to make bad decisions. That's the way mama would put it, all right? <laughs> you drink that stuff, it's going to go straight to your brain, you're going to make bad choices. And the more you drink, the more bad choices you're going to, you're going to make. We have been called, I believe, to a higher standard as Christians. You know, we've been called to special service and to serve the Lord in a very unique way as his agents in this world in which we live in to make a difference for Christ in the world we live in. There was in the Old Testament what was called a Nazarite vow. There were several people, you know, in scripture like, like Samson and Samuel and John the Baptist. They were, they were Nazarites. Now, don't confuse that with a Nazarene. A Nazarene was somebody from Nazareth, all right? A Nazarite meant it had to do with a vow that I'm gonna be a Nazarite for this period of time. And what that meant was that I, I've been called to special service or the special unique call of God on my life, like with Samson, you know, to be a judge. And so they had to make a vow and it included three things. As a, as a Nazarite, you would vow never to touch, you know, uh, wine or strong drink, no grape juice. You just, just didn't do it. All right. You just, you just didn't do it. And the other part, they couldn't touch anything that was dead, man, animal. No, nope, you can't touch anything dead. Uh, you had to stay away from it. And the other part was that they couldn't cut their hair. Now, all those have New Testament significance about separation and, 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 and spirituality and uniqueness in your life, that you're dedicated completely for the Lord. And with Samuel, I mean, with Samson, you know, he just messed up on all three. He's all time, you know, he's getting honey out of that deadline. He wasn't even supposed to touch the line. He's all time trucking through the vineyard, and getting drunk, and messing around with women. Yeah, he had one problem after another. But, you know, he lived with the idea, hey, oh, God's on my life. And look, I still have this strength from God. And I, I, you know, I'm under grace kind of thing, you know. So it says one day he didn't know that his strength was departed. And we know what happened there with his unholy haircut. Amen. The idea, even their mothers, you know, uh, they didn't, they, they, the Bible says they abstained from wine as well. Mothers of Samson and Samuel. There was another group in the Bible that said they abstained and they, they had vowed a vow of abstinence in Jeremiah 35. It was an entire group of people called the, Rebe the, the Rechabites and they were commended in scripture for their, their commitment to God and their righteous living. But one of the things about their life was that they just vowed abstinence. There's a lot in scripture in regard to wine and, and strong drink. A large majority of the Proverbs indicates that drinking, you can do it. But it's not a good choice. It's not what's best for your life. It's not what's best for your testimony. It's not what's best for your body. It clearly states even there, though, if you've got stomach issues, you know, which was a conclusion of the bad water issues of the day, then you could drink a glass. 
Now, I, I know one guy who told me, his, that's a pastor friend of mine, he said, you know, my doctor recommended I drink a glass of wine at night. I showed him a study that came out recently that said, you know, you get the same benefits from drinking one glass of wine at night as you do from drinking one glass of pure, fresh grape juice at night. That the benefit was not in the alcohol, but it was in the grapes is where the benefits were. But he started drinking one glass. That went on to drinking two glasses a night. I was on a trip with him one time where he got out a bottle of wine and he drank the whole bottle of wine while we were sitting there talking because the doctor told him to drink a glass of wine every night. <laughs> then, he started to get, then he started getting before his church and before the people that he influenced as a pastor and say, I drink wine, it's okay to drink wine, the Bible has wine in it, so you know, uh, we're good on drinking wine. And then all of a sudden, everybody in his church was drinking. You know? And what a, what a tragedy that story ended up to be, which I won't go into today, but it did, did not end well, which it usually doesn't. Because it's a, it is an issue and it's a problem for a lot of people. You say, well, Brother John, I'm a Christian. What am I called to do? Well, I really believe, you know, it is Christians that we're to have some considerations. One is, yes, we have liberty in all things, but we're not, we're not to be bound. We're not to let anything bind us. And one of the most binding influences in the world today is, is drugs and alcohol. And I put all that in the same course, in the same bottle, all right? It's all the same stuff. Drugs, alcohol, we like to call them two different things, but alcohol is a drug, simply put. It all goes together. So what does the Holy Spirit call me to do? That ought to be our question. Or not what does Brother Joe want me to do. What, what does God want me to do? How do, how do, how do, how do I handle this? You know? if, if anybody's ever seen anybody enslaved to this problem, you know the, the problems that come with it. 1 Corinthians 10, all things are lawful for me, but not, not all things are expedient. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. I believe wisdom is the greater choice. I believe it's wise for Christians not to be involved with something that has such a great potential for destruction all around them. Alcohol still has an incredible ability to destroy. Kathy and I made this decision long, long time ago in our, early in our marriage of what we were going to do. We had friends that drank, Christian friends that drank. Most of them were from California at that time, but <laughs> that's another story, Frank. You know, California's. Anyway, we, met, we, we boil this down to this, speaking of boiling it down. Number one, our consideration is the Lord. I don't want to do anything that's going to hinder my relationship with him. I don't want to do anything that, that, that offends his holiness. First Corinthians says, whether you eat or you drink, whatever you do, you do it all to the glory of God. Am I going to put myself in a situation by even taking a drink? And again, where, where does alcohol immediately begin to affect the what? The brain. So what happens if I start reasoning, should I have a second drink here? Well, I've already toasted the brain, you know, literally. <laughs> So it's easy to make that, oh, I think I have one more, I'm okay. Then your reasoning's even gone further, so maybe three won't be too bad. My position with the Lord's more important than that. I just, I just wanna, I wanna be free in Christ, I wanna love the Lord, and I, I, there's this matter of conscience between me and Him. And I need to be sincere and honest. We worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Can I be honest with God? The second consideration we consider was you. The people we would influence, the people we would minister to, our brothers, our sisters in Christ, you. I don't drink because I don't believe the Lord would be honored in it, but I don't drink because of you. I may get by at this point and say, well, hey, the Lord's not, not going to have a problem with me having a drink. All right, I may do that, but I want you to know you would have a problem with me having a drink. All right? You say, oh, man, if you drink, then I drink. There you go. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? That's the power of influence, and we're responsible for that power. We've somehow lost the concept that a believer is supposed to be living a sacrificial life. We don't, I don't live for Joe Arms. You don't live for you. We live for the Lord. All right? You say, well, you want to go, you want to, yeah, yeah, away with all yin, yin, yin stuff. You know? It's not going to kill me not to have a drink. If my, me not having a drink helps you, encourages you, strengthens you. Builds you up. Romans puts it this way in several verses, chapter 14, he deals with this whole issue. If it's because food, your brother's hurt, you're no longer walking according to love. Don't destroy him. Verse 21, it's not good to eat meat and to drink wine or to do anything which causes your brother to stumble. You know, I don't, want, I don't want this to offend you. Verse 19, let us pursue the things which make for peace, the things that build each other up. You say, well, I have a right to. You have a right to do about anything you want to do, but it's not right, all right? The greatest right we have is to exercise our rights and our liberties to honor God and to encourage one another and to build each other up. You're important. You're important to God. You're important to this fellowship. 
I want to see you be all God wants you to be. I want to be all God wants me to be. And I know there's bad choices in the context. The third reason should be obvious. It's, it's the loss, the people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. And he, he referenced that in Romans 14, but also he says in 1 Corinthians 8, he says, listen, take care lest this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to the weak. Not just a, to, to young believers, but to lost people as well. In 1 Corinthians 10, he says this, two chapters later, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks, to the church or the church of God. Just as I please all men in all things, I do not seek my own profit, but the profit of many. Why? That they may be saved. I want to do what I do to draw people to Christ. I know some people, well, I drink just to show everybody I'm like them. We may have a problem if you're like them. Are you lost? No. Are you still bound by an unregenerated heart and soul that's still corrupt? No. Are you darkness? Well, no. Are you in bondage? No. I'm a Christian. So you're not like them at all. When Paul said, I become all things to all men, he never meant he compromised any issues in his walk or in his life. He didn't compromise his convictions. We're to be a lamp. We're to have a different kind of walk. This lady I talked to, to bring in my message today, said that she had thanked me for sharing that little bit with her. She said, you know, I've discovered by my not drinking in front of them now, they're all asking questions. Yeah. You know, I'm sitting there drinking a Dr. Pepper. I said, and by the way, it's probably tastes better. <laughs> I'm sitting there drinking a Dr. Pepper and they're asking me, what's going on with you? What's that? You know, he said, I'm having the opportunity to share my, my walk, my life with Jesus to these people. She says, I wouldn't even have thought about doing that before because I'm too busy maybe not being what God called me to be. The Bible says we give no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. But why else? Well, let's say uh, we don't because the Lord. We don't because of the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't because of people we want to reach for Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, one of the big reasons for us, this is almost equal to number one, just secondary on our list, is our loved ones, my family, and ourselves. You know? Our family. I don't. I want them to have a, somebody they can look to and say, they're different. I want my children to say, well, the, everybody else is doing but they didn't. Well, what, what, I don't need to. I'm free in Christ. You know, I may not be the most interesting man in the world. <laughs> I'm the most interesting man in the world. I do not always drink beer. But when I do, it's a root beer. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Let me put it the way Solomon put it. The wisest man who ever lived. If you read Solomon's story and look at briefly this history of his life, you see that this guy just went all, all the way out. He just said all overboard, I'm going to do what I want. I'll do what feels good. I'll do what I want to do when I want to do it. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. If I want to drink, I'll get, if I'll drink, I'm going to get drunk. I'll get drunk. If I want to have women, I'll have women. We see his whole life was experienced on that kind of level. It doesn't tell us exactly how many years this went on, but at the end of it, Solomon says to his family, vanity, vanity is all is vanity. The word vanity means empty headed foolishness. To live that kind of life and live that kind of way, that's foolishness. He wraps up his words in Proverbs 20 in this regard, and he says something about it in 30 as well. He says, wine is a, is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And if you're deceived by it, then you're a fool. Why would you waste your life and waste your time? Alcohol in the home is like leaving a loaded revolver out for your children to get a hold of. Even it's sitting on the dresser. You may use it for self-defense. <laughs> They'll use it for self-destruction. We often hear stories, even in the news this week, about some kid who got into a gun cabinet, shot themselves or wounded themselves. My drinking started as a young teenage boy by stealing liquor out of my friend's liquor cabinets, their parents. That's usually where it begins for teenagers, isn't it? Admittedly, some people drink most of their life and they can do it in moderation, they never, and they control their drinking all their life. But you listen to me carefully. There are millions upon millions of people who cannot. And it's going to produce misery and pain and heartache. For me, when the liquor industry says drink responsibly, that means no thank you. That's the most responsible thing you can do with a bottle of alcohol. No thank you. Now, in spite of everything I've just shared with you, why do, why do people still continue to drink? 
I think a lot of it has to do with the culture, it has to do with the media. You know, if you don't drink, there's something wrong with you. It's all about getting drunk on the weekend. It's all about party time. It's all about, you know, Miller time and all the other times. But you know what? Most, pe most people drink because it gives them a sense of security and sociability and relaxation. Some drink because it gives them a sense of empowerment, joy, or some kind of exhilaration. I need to distress. My favorite one is this. I deserve a drink. I deserve a drink. Oh, you deserve so much better. <laughs> you deserve a trip to Calvary to find the grace of God on your life. Amen. I did, but then that really gets down to, oh, I could use a drink. I just, why could you? Because I just need to lay back. I need to, I'm just in turmoil. I've just got this stress. I've got these problems. I, you know, I, I, just, I just need a drink. But let me tell you, let me give you something the Bible does very clearly in Scripture. It presents alcohol as a lying, deceiving force influencing your life. But on the other hand, it presents this other influencing factor, and it's called the Holy Spirit. It's a him. He's a person. And the Bible says in Ephesians, don't get drunk. That's just reckless action. It's a debauchery is another word it used. It's recklessness. But instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. English Standard Version puts it this way. Hey, don't get drunk. That's debauchery. That's a pretty simple word for Christians. Don't get drunk. Amen. I'm under grace. Still, don't get drunk. <laughs> That's reckless. It's debauchery. It's, it's not what God intended for your life. But rather... Be filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, we have this artificial, and Satan is always good at bringing an artificial, isn't he, and a counterfeit in. There's this artificial counterpart to what being filled with the Spirit is. It's called alcohol. All right? Where can I find a sense of security? Where do I find a sense of satisfaction? Where do I find a sense of peace? Where do I find release? Where do I find distressing? You find it through a personal, deeper fellowship with the Holy Spirit in your life. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the context, again, is don't get drunk but be filled. In other words, you're drinking from this cup, try this beverage. <laughs> you're drinking from that cup, try this cup. Tr you drink from that well, well, try drinking from this well. You tried the 1100 Springs of the Colorado Rockies, that's wonderful. Try this one over here. This one's a much more refreshing drink. And by the way, when you drink from this one, you really take a drink from the Holy Spirit in your life, you're not going to wake up hungover or in bed with somebody you don't even know. <laughs> You know, or lying in a back alley beat up somewhere. Right. Or calling your insurance company saying, I wrecked my car last night. <laughs> and all the other stupid things that people do when they get drunk. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, all you got to do is ask. He said, if you ask, you seek, you'll find. He said, I'm not going to give you a stone. I'm not going to, if you request bread. And my father's not going to give you a serpent if you request the Spirit. So ask my father. He said, what do you mean? Find some time. You need to de-stress. Get your Bible out. Turn on some praise and worship music. Take some time to, to just worship the Lord. And you'll be surprised how it just starts going away. Amen. You'll be surprised what God will do in those moments you start turning. The Bible says, cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. When you try to quit putting those cares down that little neck in that bottle and, you know, trying to see if they'll just drown, <laughs> cast everything on the Lord Jesus and see what he does. The alternative is much, much better. Why don't we? We've made it pretty clear this morning why we don't. It's a choice. In Scripture, you see it over and over again, but it's a bad choice. Amen? Amen. I'm not telling you what you can do or you can't do as a pastor of this church, but I am challenging you today on your behavior. I am challenging you to take a step higher. I am challenging you to climb the mountain a little more. I am challenging you to go a little deeper with Jesus now. I am challenging you to leave the nominal humdrum norm fitting into the world system and saying, you know, God's called me to something higher and God has called me to something better and I want the best that God has for me. Amen. Now listen, I'll close with this. I sat down and made a list of about 20 things of what's getting ready to happen in our culture since this new Supreme Court ruling. All right? And I would say to this, there are things that are getting ready to happen that are so going to be so, so alarming I and mean, you're going to sit back and say, what happened to America? You know, I know some of you are already shaking heads already saying that. But there are things getting ready to come down the pike. As a result of that one decision, they're opening the door for so many issues that we're going to be facing culturally. You're going to want to go get drunk. <laughs> but I counsel you. That's not the answer. Your answer is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's what happens. When you do choose to be filled with the Holy Spirit, then you become the answer for everything that's going on over there. 
Then you become the solution for the problems. Then you become the remedy for the change that needs to take place in our world. Because when God's people get filled with the Holy Spirit, it's a radical change in the environment around their lives. Amen? Let me just bow our heads for a moment. I'm not going to give an invitation this morning, but I am going to ask.